Abby, you were saying uh, being seven minutes late adds some mystique? Yeah. Oh, we're live now. Yeah, we're <laughs> live now. Here, I'll do, I'll, do the, I'll do the countdown so that we can kind of build some suspense. Here we go. I wonder how many, I wonder if the person who did that music got paid. What do you think, Eddie? That's a good question. Probably if they did, it wasn't very much. It was probably like a one time. Do you think it was like the it, the child of of uh, the founder of StreamYard or something? He did it in GarageBand and now it's the most popular piece of music ever made. It could be. I think what Peter's trying to get at here is I didn't make an intro yet, but I'm learning how to use <laughs> Adobe After Effects. So for next week, expect a really cool one. But we do have George Webb in the in the house. Uh, yeah, should we time. add him here? Should we, so uh, I wait. think I think we'll, we'll be satisfied. It, look, it, it looks like his mic is off. Let me unmute the mic. Here oh, I got, you, I got it. Thanks, guys. Hey, Addy, how you doing? Hey, George, doing great. How you doing, sir? Good. Good seeing you, and uh, congratulations on your new book, your second book. Um, yeah, yeah thanks, what's George. the book what's the book title again annie uh it's how to cover the glenn maxwell trial and so. you sure did a good job of that so just Thank get the you. book get the book plugs out of the way while we're going okay peter it's your show I'm sorry it's my show uh, yeah well jo george when you reached out to me i thought that there was something that you were aching to talk about so i'm just uh i know that victoria newland you know one of you know, Victoria, Lee Stranahan and, 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 uh, and George Webb were like four years ahead of everybody on the Victoria Newland story. And George, you were years ahead on the bio lab. Like the first time that you started saying bio labs and bio weapons. And I, I guess one person's bio weapon center is another person's bio research center. Is that the way it works? Well, Peter, you're coming in choppy. And I don't know if I'm choppy, oh. but. Hang on, let me make sure that my, oh. Okay, now now I got it. All right, this is Backblaze. Once again, uh, anybody who's using Backblaze backup, there's no way to turn it off. You can only pause it. So I paused it before I started it. So now I've got a monitor up right now. So if, if I'm choppy, tell me, because I can fix it. Okay, uh, I'm just going to make this comment. Uh, Peter Strzok, if you're... Uh, hacking this broadcast. <laughs> uh, Peter Strzok did uh, did tweet me out and my tweets out yesterday. Uh, you must be of, living rent free in his head, George. Well, I do think so. Uh, we have the IP addresses. Peter knows it. Uh, Fruman and Parnas, Battelle, Columbus, Lisa Page. It's it's over. It's direct link to Kolomoisky. So he knows it. Uh, and we're going to uncover this thing uh, one step at a time. But uh, I. I thought he did something very interesting, which I call liars, um, a liar's tell uh, or sort of a liar's flinch. And he combined some things in his tweet about Q, Trump and fake virus. And if you look at the liar's tell there, it's we used something like Q fever to take out Trump as our insurance policy uh, using something that has very similar effects to the coronavirus and we use coronavirus as a mock virus now to me that's what he was screaming metadata wise and i looked into q fever somebody in new orleans and when annie and i were down there last year we had gone to this guy and he said you know q is fever trump's trying to tell you that it's q fever and uh maybe that's the case uh this is a year ago um, so here, here, so here's what I'm thinking, because I, I kind of think about this from an information warfare standpoint, too. Um, a lot of times it seems that when I go to research things, um, I will run into this problem where there's something in the entertainment business um, that has wound up creating so much content on the Internet that whatever it is that I'm looking for is completely buried under a pile of stuff. And so if there actually was a Q fever component to some kind of a 
a, a, a bioweapons program. Wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense that if you started a movement that was called Q, that one of the benefits of naming it that way is that it would push all of the, the, the relevant data for people for things that researchers would be looking for way down. And you'd have to really get detailed in your compound searches to be able to find that stuff. Um, so my communications are spotty, but I think I heard what you said, Q being a cover for the Q fever. And I looked it up briefly today and I saw uh, four different tests of Q fever in uh, Ukraine, many uh, breakouts of Q fever, Q fever breakout from January 1st, 2018 in China all the way through the Wuhan military games in, in November. Uh, in Afghanistan, there was all kinds of breakouts of Q fever. This is a rare, very rare African fever, and that's why it's so hard to diagnose. So you could spread something that's common, like coronavirus, as your mock virus or your attenuated virus, uh, sort of as your publicity virus, if you will. And then you could use Q fever to create some really long-term COVID type uh, effects. Same thing, myocarditis, same thing with the, uh, uh, you know, the cough, the, uh, the weakness, the body joint pain, the pneumonia, all these same things in Q fever and very close to Congo Crimea hemorrhagic fever, which has also started in Crimea after the war. And a lot of people think the Nazis started it after the war. Uh, and we've been watching this uh, Ukraine pro. A lot of people think the Nazis started everything. Like all, all of this stuff <laughs> that we're yeah. dealing with now. <laughs> so Q fever, disease caused, caused by the bacterium Coxiella burnetii, flu-like symptoms uh, spread via bodily fluid uh, or inhalation of a spore-like small cell. Incubation 9 to 40 days and... Yeah, it can be can be fatal. Yeah, I, th I think the thing about Q fever that's really hard to diagnose is so few Western doctors have seen it. And it goes inside your Pac-Man. Your first line of defense in your immune system is your innate defense. So that's your Pac-Man. And instead of eating and digesting the Q fever uh, bacterium, it ingests it. But then Q fever is smart enough to encapsulate itself. And it just lives. And, you, you know, the more your macrophages get bigger and stronger, the more Q fever uh, lingers, very much like Ebola. And so that's where, um, uh, you know, I, when I hear somebody with the liar's poker, with the liar's flinch, like struck talking, I hear, I, I actually hear it in metadata. I don't actually hear what he's saying. I hear him saying, it's Q fever, you idiot. <laughs> you guys have missed it all along. It's Q fever. That's why we came out with Q. Don't you understand? Like Peter said, don't you understand this is a cover? Um, right, but, it, but it, it has a practical use case, which is that if you, get a, if you get millions of people tweeting and posting about something called Q, and w when people go to start to research Q fever, uh, their ability to search for it is, is, is mitigated. Like they, they can't really do it because there's, a, there's too much uh, noise in the, in the, in the signal. Right. I mean, I, I, I put the stuff out there to get it beyond the sensors and beyond the search engines uh, to, on my Twitter so that people could see actually what it is. And I should have taken the, the, the doctor's comments in New Orleans more seriously uh, that, hey, have you considered this? You know, Struck, uh, Peter Struck's dad was in the Safari Club and the Safari Club was a CIA covert group in, in uh, Kenya, in Africa. And there's a Wikipedia page on it and so forth. And he was very close with the guy who ran Savak, which was the very uh, nasty uh, secret police in Iran, a guy named Nasiri. So these guys have been doing these things for a long time, especially in Africa. And, um, you know, I thought, well, you know, here's Peter Strzok with Congo Crimea hemorrhagic fever and all these programs with Victoria Nuland. Um, I see Mark Kulak in the, in the audience. Hey, Mark. So I just uh, it, it just made me think. Was the doctor right? Was the doctor right? Was this the obvious tell that this was Q fever? Uh, Mark Kulak's research did a great uh, piece on how the original virus for Spanish flu also accompanied this pneumonia 
with all these horses that were going over and traveling with the soldiers in World War I. Uh, so some very similar parallels here between Q fever now and uh, Spanish flu way back then, 100 years ago. Go ahead. I'm Peter. just ta I'm just taking it all in. Um, Peter Strzok. Um, it is you know it, it's funny that uh, uh, you know Mark Kulak's you know ent entree into all of this stuff was that he was just a normal guy working for a technology company, and Peter Strzok came into the company that he was working at on I think October six, two thousand and fifteen and pulled all of the, uh, the servers out of the rack. Um, and it, it, it's very interesting because his name just keeps coming up in, in all of these different places. And it just seemed to me completely out of character for him to kind of like lose his cool and go after, you know, this random George Webb guy on the, on the internet. Because it, it just gives you more credibility, I think, when he does that. It, uh, it, it gives, it adds your name to his platform. I guess is the uh, is the analysis of that. Yeah, and he told three lies. He said I was a Q person. I'm anti Q the movement. I'm probably way more pro Q fever now because of Peter Strzok. Uh, um, and I'm, I, you know, I voted for Obama twice. I never voted for Trump. I gave Bernie uh, three different contributions. Those are the last three political contributions. So he's trying to say Trump. He's trying to say fake virus. Oops, I haven't vaccinated. Oops, I believe in safe vaccines. Uh, and tested vaccines, oopsie, 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 your whole case. And then ABC came out with the exact same verbiage that Strzok tweeted out about me yesterday on Sunday, word for word. It's like he's the new broadcast board of governors. He's the new radio for Europe, you know, radio for well, they, Europe. They gave, they, you know, they gave him a year hiatus, and now they need to put him back into the rotation. But, George, the conspiracy theorists are going to go crazy with this video because because of the light coming through the, the blinds in your... You know, you keep looking at the screen. Because of the bl light coming through the blinds, uh, combined with the American flag with the stripes there, it actually creates a pyramid. There's a pyramid there, so... <laughs> There's... Go the conspiracy right theory. The conspiracy theorists. You got to move your eye up a little bit in order to get the. Okay. Uh... Hold on, I'll be right back. <laughs> All right. Okay, so he, this is uh, struck today, right? Or was this yesterday? This was today, wasn't it? Russia's basis claims about secret American biological warfare labs in Ukraine are uniting COVID nineteen conspiracy theorists, QAnon adherents, and some supporters of ex president. Donald Trump sure are. Can't tell you how difficult it was to get from Guantanamo to Donbass. Responding to George's tweet, I'm not saying this is an Obama smear because it's true, but you're going to find new one in Strucker behind the secret labs in the Donbass. The Russian military metadata activity points to Mariupol, not Odessa. Wow, that is great. That is great. Well, th Peter this Strzok. was yesterday. This was, yesterday. was yesterday. Okay. And and, and, and I, I couldn't see it because I have the honor of having been blocked by Peter Strzok. Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. You've been blocked too, I'm sure, eh, George? Uh, I'm, having, well? I'm having some tech difficulties, so I'm going to exit and then come back, okay? Okay, okay. All right, yeah, shut some things down or something. Yeah, that's it. So yeah, so uh, yeah, when I saw that, I thought, man, this is, you know, some people may think it's an own. I think it's winning. You know, when when oh you, yeah, uh, oh yeah. yeah, for sure, for sure, this is a big W. Anytime you can get a response from someone like this, I, I think for sure it's a it's a win. So it's um, a big W for the big W. Is that the deal? I think so. I think so. And looks like he's back. Let's see. Let's see if we can hear us now. I think I can hear you, Addy. This is much better. Yeah. We, we were calling it a big W for the big W. I think it is, and it's more important a big W for everybody around the world. So it's really a W for the world. Uh, we've all been hit by this thing. I'm not saying it. Here's the thing. It struck saying it's fake virus. I never said that. I said it was a live attenuated virus or, or an attenuated thing to, to create the scare. I even called it Clockwork Orange. You use a lot of, you use a big fear tool to create a big yellow fever um, of fear, and then you use a little bit of blood. You got to throw a little bit of blood in there. You combine the two; that's orange, and you work it in a clockwork way in a lockstep manner, and it's clockwork orange. 
I said that five years ago now on Alex Jones's show, and that's how these things work, and that's exactly what happened with this thing. I missed the yellow fever, though. It turned out to be Q fever, and I don't know if it's Q fever. I don't know if it's Cong Congo Crimea hemorrhagic fever, but I do know that when Dilyana came out with this stuff, we've been covering it for five years, she's putting up the papers. Operation Big Bite, Operation Big Itch. These are not defensive programs. Here's the Russians talking about the what they believe are bioweapons attacks in 2008 in Georgia, 2014 in the overthrow of Yanukovych. And now they saw this as the third strike. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, it, there may be just some justification if the Russians put forth the information. This was a good start at the Security Council. You don't call Security Council meetings just because you didn't have anything to do that day. Um, I don't know how many times the Russians have called a Security Council meeting, but it was, you know, pretty strong allegations. You know, so catch me up. Catch me up on that. I think I might have missed that news. Sure. Uh, the Russian uh, diplomat yesterday uh, or on Sunday, which uh, or excuse me, on Friday, uh, it was a short thing. It was I don't know if you can see this. Kirilov is the name of the guy. Right. Uh, OK, Kirilov, can you see it? Yep. OK. And this is his statement. But it reiterates all the bioweapons charges. It says 2008, uh, African swine flu was modified into a chimera and used in the Georgia campaign. It talks about all these different breakouts of the different um, hemorrhagic fevers. There's something called hantavirus and leptovirus that are more rodent associated. Right. I, I've never said those were the ones, uh, you know, for soldiers crawling on their hands and knees. That's how you get the rodent poop type stuff. Right. We always talked, and this goes right back to Mark Kulak, about things that are ticks or fleas, because those can travel on bats, those can travel on migratory birds. It's the ticks and the fleas is the name of the game, Lyme disease, all these other things. Uh, right, but and, and if you go back and look at Annie Jacobs, Jacobson's work on Operation Paperclip, they were working on those kind of flea-borne, uh, because they they wanted to disrupt the Russians' ability, the Germans wanted to disrupt the Russians' ability to make food. So they wanted to affect their cattle. They wanted to affect their pigs. They wanted to affect their chickens. They uh, wanted to basically destroy their protein creation uh, by using uh, bioweapons like that. And we, you know, when we think of bioweapons, we think of you know things that attack human beings. But the Nazis, uh, they were. Uh, equal opportunist uh, biology attack vectors. Yeah, they use nature's bioweapons. That's what you're saying, yeah. right? Well, they, they again. I, I think that they were they 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 weren't just weaponizing diseases to attack human beings. Like there's all this there's all this bird flu that's bird flu that's been going around. And if you follow Ice Age Farmer, then you know that you know there's millions of of uh, uh, chickens that have been slaughtered last year. Uh, because of bird flu. Um, these things, you know, you're not attacking human beings directly, but if you take all the protein out of their diet, it certainly isn't uh, optimal. And, and God bless uh, Peter Strzok, again, for, Q, for giving us Q fever because it attacks livestock mostly. Um, and the, the up improvement of Q fever over, let's say, anthrax, similar type of thing, uh, sporulating it's with spores that can kind of wait till the conditions are right uh, it'll stay on the ground for months so the cows will eat it if they don't get it today they'll get it tomorrow if the sheep don't get it today they're gonna get it tomorrow or over a period of months so Peter Strzok it's almost like you know when when they get angry and they slash out they end up throwing the critical missing piece sometimes at you um, you know, it's like, I never did that because I was over here. Oh, you were over there. <laughs> you know, oh, you were at Ford's Theater with, with Lincoln. Okay, thanks. Um, that's kind of what I saw yesterday. Um, and uh, I've been tracking the Q fever in Afghanistan. It seems like a very long-term program there. Uh, there's four different regions with using Ukrainian military to test Q fever and Congo, Crimea, hemorrhagic fever in Ukraine. Uh, we had breakouts in Holland, of all places, in 2015. I've talked about the Erasmus Lab and their background in uh, bioweapons for NATO. So there's just a whole lot of data now pouring in because of Peter Strzok's kind of lashing out. Um, yeah, and Wild Tangent asks, is, is there an ivermectin connection? Uh, 
uh, again, it seemed to me that the reaction against ivermectin was disproportionate. Uh, uh, th th that is, they re th the the uh, amount of effort, time, energy, and um, uh, malice that went into getting ivermectin off of the shelves and out of the uh, therapy routine. Uh, it, it, it seemed it seemed odd to me. It seemed in, uh, inappropriate, um, and maybe it's because ivermectin actually does have some use against other things that are in the pipeline. Well, ivermectin kind of pops the bubble uh, for bacteria, and uh, but the the treatment for Q fever is HCQ. They have to take it for like a year and a half. The prophylactically, though, HCQ is effective. So again, the same kind of battle. So, more, more, so I should get a, I should get my fever tree out of the. <laughs> drink up, right. drink that lemon juice or, or lime juice. It's lemon, right? Well, this remember. is just uh, lemon cello Lacroix, but uh, I do uh, when I when I got. Uh, he, he, Addy's giving me a thumbs down because you like the real limoncello. I got to tell you, if you put <laughs> real limoncello in the limoncello Lacroix, it's as a spritzer, it's very good. There you go. You like the spirit, not the water. I just think that limoncello flavor water is not very good, is all. Uh, but yeah, limoncello is good. Yeah. It's because you like l real limoncello, so you, so it just reminds you of something that you really want. Yeah. Any anyway, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah. When I got COVID, uh, I pounded uh, a bottle of diet quinine water, diet tonic water every a liter a day you know and uh that was part of my regime so i don't know how much quinine is in quinine water but uh quinine being the the organic form of hydroxychloroquine right that the that the british used as a tonic against malaria yes yeah. in world war ii as well as used by i think all sides as an well, well i i think hydroxychloroquine was invented during world war ii because they couldn't get enough quinine because uh, the mm. Japanese had captured uh, the part of the world that where all the quinine came from. Oh, interesting. I think. Well, uh, doxycycline. People can is... fact check me on that. <laughs> oh, uh, wait, Doxy... we're just going to talk about Lyme disease. No, 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 no. Mark, that's Mark's area of expertise. I, I just want to say that uh, Mark's done some great work on Plum Island, and now Plum Island's moving out to Manhattan, Kansas. That shouldn't bother anybody. That's right. It's right by our food Leavenworth. chain. Leavenworth. Leavenworth. <laughs> <laughs> Fort Riley, <laughs> Fort Riley is where uh, you know Spanish flu started. So, don't don't worry. Just have another steak. But doxycycline is the antibiotic that is prescribed for Q fever, and that's another one that they're trying not to prescribe. Uh, so, um, because of the idea of resistance. So I just, you know, I just God bless Peter Struck and and Peter, if you're listening, tweet out again, lash out again, please. It's 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 a metadata explosion. Uh, when you lash out, please do. Well, I do. I do have a a, a video that I did of uh, uh, Mark walking his dog Guster uh, and talking about the whole event of the FBI coming into uh, Dato Systems and pulling the uh, the rack out. So I, maybe I can I can I can uh, post that and you can retweet it. We can see if Strzok. Uh, it's got and it's got uh, the document with Strzok's signature on it in the video. That Can I, we play it now? I, I'm I'm on pins and needles now. It would probably be hard to find. Well, if you talk to Addy for a second, then maybe yeah, I can find it. Up it. Yeah. yeah. All right. I was just go. gonna say the reason I guess Lyme's disease was the next topic that George is gonna bring up is because doxycycline is used to treat uh, Lyme's disease. Uh, but I, I also wanted to bring something up of uh, Mark Kulak's as well at Housatonic Live, a young. Senator Obama in 2005 shaking hands with the president of Ukraine as Senator Lugar and the Defense Threat Reduction Agency agree for United States money to protect pathogens that could be used for biological weapons in Ukraine. Then Ukrainian President Viktor Yushchenko shaking hands with Senator Richard Lugar, Republican from Indiana, and Barack Obama then senator of, uh, excuse me, from Illinois in Kiev, uh, Ukraine. Yeah, and so I great, think, great find. Uh, yeah, and I think the central repository, the central reference library, which is the old biopreparat 
uh, refrigerator, this is the old Soviet bioweapons refrigerator, gets moved to Odessa. The, the extremely deadly pathogens get moved to Odessa. The lab isn't built till 2010, I don't think. Uh, but there, there's Obama. I'm just going to get my punch in for Obama so Peter Strzok knows what side I'm on. Obama's the one who stopped the gain-of-function work in 2014. And where did they move? Where did the, the Victoria Newlands of the world move the program? They moved it to Kazakhstan. They created a new lab and built a new lab in Kazakhstan to move the central reference library. And they built another one. They just built a new one for them and upgraded the central reference library. And this is this unholy connection between Kazakhstan central reference library and the Odessa library is going to come out. You're going to see the people that are the go-betweens are Felix Sater. It is going to be Parnas and Fruman. The IP addresses are going to turn out to be right. And the third location is Tbilisi, Georgia. And all of those locations are in Kolomoisky's Triangle of the Azov Brigade. This is going to be an Azov Brigade production. We'll just wait to see what happens. All right. I've got a question about Kolomoisky. I think I found the video, but I'm, I'm afraid to hit the button because it's going to launch it. So I wanted you to stop. So here we go. Let me okay. see if I can. All right, I hit open. There we go. This is sort of like Blair Witch Project. Yeah, Mark was live streaming one. Good night. evening. This is Guster the Briard. Guster. 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 He's more handsome than me. And that's damn handsome. Big stick. This goes for a few minutes, so I hope you guys are patient. Well, Anyways, I think so what Guster, Guster makes a good little backdrop. I just saw a couple of tweets about fucked up mine, talking about DNC replica servers, and I uh, just wanted to verify. That's kind of how I got started in this little mess. I worked at a company called Datto, D-A-T-T-O. I uh, started there around September of 2015. And when I was at Datto Corporation, it's supposed to be my dream job. It was my first job where I got to be a director of a whole function. And a week after the job started, things started getting really weird. Uh, my boss got uh, pulled in some meetings. A bunch of people started to need to go to, uh, to, to D.C. Supposedly something was going on with uh, email. Um, and as I found out later, I mean, I was pretty naive to all of the details. You can hear the beautiful little crickets in the background in our yard. We have a good sized yard here in Massachusetts. Um, and I started to figure out that um, something happened. It had really didn't have anything necessarily to do with uh, Dado's own choices. Uh, and again, as I was just starting to say, I was pretty naive to the specifics of the situation and politics in general, actually. I guess I always leaned a little bit, maybe conservative, but I'm also, you know, very environmental and everything else that, you know, a typical 30, 40 year old would be in the tech industry. And as I learned over time is what had happened was, is there was an accidental backup of uh, Hillary Clinton's emails to an off-site backup server. An accidental backup. That whole picture that you see regarding the uh, the email backups and like in a bathroom server, that thing is a total hoax. That's not true. That's not the truth. The specific situation is that there was a backup device, a physical backup device from Dato Corporation used. Um, it was paid for by the... Uh, uh, the service provider that Hillary Clinton was uh, was using. And that system was making essentially hourly full disk image backups of her email server to an offsite location. Uh, a disk image backup is one where the entire image of the disk, including you know all the blocks that are on the uh, the disk drives, the solid state drive, you know whether it be a solid state or a mechanical hard drive, everything all the metadata, all the file system metadata 
everything necessary to reconstruct that system is backed up on an hourly basis. That means that even if the data is logically deleted, well, you know what, unless the data is actually scrubbed, even if the data is scrubbed on the disk, there are backup copies and backups have a retention of up to several years. Um, so, so I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to pause it here because I think we all know the rest of the story here. But I, I just wanted to bring up that there's his name again coming up again, and something that you used to talk about uh, back in the day, George. What? Let me figure out a way to remove this. Um, was DTRA, and that uh, you were talking to Robin Gritz back in the day, and Robin Gritz as I remember, couldn't find any record of Peter Strzok having attended the FBI Academy. Um, and so I think the hypothesis was that after 9-11, uh, there was cooperation between all the three-letter agencies in the government and that uh, they created these fusion centers that are these Phoenix program, Reinhard Gellin inventions. Um, and that the, the idea was that maybe Peter Strzok came into the FBI through an, the intelligence community as opposed to the, uh, uh, the normal FBI agent route. Well, I can um, say that categorically he did not go to the FBI Academy. Uh, Robin Gritz, for instance, said, hey, Gaddis is the guy who was ahead of me in the class because GH is, you know, uh, GR was after, you know, before GH and he sat ahead of me in class. Peter Strzok did not go through class. He at 27, he is inserted through the DIA, a DTRA, uh, which is the back door here, the vaccine virus vaccine game back door, into the FBI counterintelligence group. Uh, I saw uh, Thermobstrafol on the uh, chat here talking about are they related? Is that family, the police family, the McCabe family, related to the Yonkers police chief or? Uh, or grandfather of James Comey, who was the chief of police in Yonkers in New York. No way. <laughs> and I, I, probably, probably. <laughs> but this this document here, what it really reminds me of is Mark was in Boston, and that meant Peter Strzok was in Boston when he raced out of the office to go get this once he heard there was a backup. I don't. Th I don't think. I think Mark says that he wasn't in the same office that the servers were in. That no, I'm not. I'm yeah. not talking about Mark. I'm talking yeah. about Peter Strzok. It, you know. So yeah. yeah, Peter Peter Strzok raced out to the office, and this this office was somewhere in the like Route 128 area or some, somewhere in the Boston area. Okay, and the, and the point is, go back to 9/11. Who's the guy who just who found the car of the hijackers going to uh, the the airport? Peter Strzok, right? So you know, it's didn't know that, but I just gave me a chill up my spine. <laughs> Peter Strzok. Right? Who's the guy who uh, cracked down on all the whistleblowers from Guantanamo in his little special office in Guantanamo, like John Kiriakou? Peter Strzok, right? So he ran this counterintelligence group. Who ran all the Anna Chapman illegals when they were trying to create this idea that these sloppy uh, spies that were all super sexy were was where the action was in New York when in actual fact they had two uh, top scientists embedded at the University of Washington doing all kinds of foreign cleavage on all kinds of new diseases at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center and the University of Washington. Peter Strzok. Um, this is why when Carter Page and uh, was being shown as a hero, I said, wait a minute, does anybody know that Carter Page worked with the illegals for 10 years as a CIA uh, informant? Carter Page denied that, denied that, denied that. Finally, one day on Maria Bartiromo. He admitted that he was a long-term CIA. CFR, Maria Bartiromo. Yeah, asset, <laughs> asset. Yeah, CFR, yeah. yeah. So I'm just saying that it's always the same small group of guys. It's this small cabal, always, always, always. It's never the big group like you think it is. And so this, I mean, this is sort of the trouble I have with Alex at InfoWars is the cabal, the globalists, you know, the cartel, over the globalists. And I'm like, no, actually, it's about six guys. <laughs> so... Well, if you you know if you if you have trillions of dollars to play with, you don't need more than six guys. Yeah, if you have a, a force multipliers like Jeff Prather said, if you have force multipliers like the media, and you tweet something out like you're the broadcast board of governors or whatever that new agency is now before or after Radio Free Year, hey, that's the power and like that's the Wizard of Oz, man. You got all the 
the levers and gizmos. And when you say Radio Free Europe, and the first name that jumps into my head is Tucker Carlson because his father ran Radio Free Europe. And when we talk about DTRA, I can't help but think of that's Robert Malone's, Dr. Robert Malone's outfit, right? And, and it's Fort Belvoir, always Fort Belvoir. Fort Belvoir. And, but Robert Malone will never, ever say bioweapon. Like, bioweapon is not a, a word that ever comes out of his mouth. Well, and, and what's one person's bioweapon is another person's uh, test sample. Mm -hmm. Because, like Mark Kulak says, you need to have an atomic bomb so you can test atomic bomb goggles. You know, we... <laughs> <laughs> but we Mark doesn't believe we that Mark but doesn't Mark doesn't believe that you can test the goggles. D but bad example. Bad yeah, example. Okay. <laughs> but but hey, I needed to make the I needed to bring back Spanish flu so that I could come up with a universal vaccine just in case anybody else ever brought it back that we would all live as elites and you would all die. You know, we, that's that's defensive in in Peter Strzok's head. So I'm trying to remember where I heard this, but I, I, I heard at some point, and Mark probably would be the person to ask about this, is that it wasn't uh, Spanish flu bacterial, and d didn't it turn out that they could have just cured it if they had antibiotics at the time? Well, it, they went side by side. So there was a pneumonia in the horses, and who knows what caused it. Um, could have been a lot of different things. Could have just been regular pneumococcus. But there's a lot of things that cause pneumonia. Uh, may have been Q fever is one of the things that causes pneumonia, but uh, they attributed. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, maybe we've been missing this for a hundred years. <laughs> you know, right. Peter Duesberg, you know, the guy who came up with Bayer, the guy who came up with heroin, and the guy who came up with you know uh, poison gas in World War One. You know, maybe he's just played this cute uh, card over and over. But anyway, something causes. I pneumonia. think Peter Duesberg is somebody else, isn't it? Well, Peter Duesberg, th there's uh, another Duesberg that did the Duesberg scholarships. Well, there's a Duesberg, I think, in uh, in RFK Jr.'s book that comes up all That's the time. That's a good Duesberg. He's the guy right. who was saying, hey, where is the proof for that HIV virus actually causes AIDS? You know, that's that Peter Duesberg. Right. But the other Duesberg, the Duesberg scholarship Duesberg, that Duesberg gave Muhammad Atta, I should give you pause, gave Muhammad Atta a scholarship. Now, that's not for flying. Muhammad Atta couldn't fly. That was, that's because for bioweapons, right? So, and I had somebody tell that to me to my face. So I'm just saying, German intelligence- And this was before bioweapons were even cool. That was before bioweapons were cool. And that's when I thought uranium was cool. And this guy came up and slapped me upside the head and said, it's bioweapons, you idiot. Fort Dietrich, you're out there at Fort Dietrich with the task force. What did you think they make there? You think they make- uh, you know, reactors up there. Uh, and I fell for the whole story, but task force didn't. And, and this guy said, Hey, it's Duesberg, Muhammad Atta. You know, there was a, a thing that, uh, Mark put out about, uh, this propaganda on September the 10th, the day before September the 11th, uh, here comes, uh, our Rumsfeld saying a drone attack. Did you, did you, have you ever heard the story? A drone attack with anthrax the day before nine 11, nine on the 10th of September. I never heard that story before. Um, and he, and that even, was before drones were cool. That was before drones were cool. And that was <laughs> the L-29 or something, uh, autonomous drone that Saddam Hussein, because they had a real problem. We don't have any smoking gun to Iraq to invade. So we need somebody to, to come up with a smoking gun. And somebody had sat around and said, hey, Kofor, you know that bin Laden family. You've been doing pipelines with them for 20 years. You've been sending them weapons for 20 years to fight the Russians let's make them the bad guy and then we can do anything we want right but then how do you then move the hate after 9 11 how do you move it to iraq to justify the uh, intervention in iraq and the only way you could have do it was with Pol colin powell waving the little thing of yellow cake right. which turned out to be false um yeah you know all of these stories just makes me think. Do you, do you remember this painting, The Boulevard of Broken Dreams? I can't remember the name of the uh, the artist. Somebody in the chat room will remember. But I, I just have this. I, I have this picture in my head of Osama bin Laden and Jeffrey Epstein and uh, Muhammad Atta, and they're all like laying on lawn chairs at, at, the, at, on the, at the beach, and they're drinking drinks with little umbrellas on them. You know, and they're on, they're on some island someplace. They're they're like the old days when they had the casting system where everybody was on contract. 
mm-hmm. and they'd say, "Hey, Bogey, we need a bad guy. Come in. <laughs> you know, here's your right. lines." You know, yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, and you know, they're, they're not the, right there. But yeah, that they're not really dead. They're just. This is actually not the painting. This is somebody's oh. interpretation of the painting. But um, well, Aaron thinks that Epstein's in Israel with a like a beard like down to here and he's pretending to be a rabbi or something so i think he's dead yeah yeah i mean there is some interesting connections with epstein uh to this unitaid and the whole kind of diversion of money from the european aviation tax to support uh aids testing in africa and that developed developed a whole virus vaccine game in africa so Jeff Epstein does get involved in Unitaid quite a bit. As a matter of fact, if you listen to Jeff Epstein talk about defending himself, he would talk about AIDS a lot and, and HIV a lot in Africa. Uh, so, um, and I know he has done a lot of work with that, and Ryan Dawson and other folks have done a lot with that. You said Unitaid? Or Unitaid, Unit, Unitaid, U-N-I-T-A-I-D. This was okay. big with... Uh, or Charles Hertel has was the first person to tell me about Unitaid in 2017 about how they take a money out of every ticket you went to Europe, and they would divert to like we are the world, you know that that whole thing, yeah. And and that actually was going for a virus vaccine game. And the interesting thing about the RFK book in the first chapter, they talk about Unitaid. The guy wow. says who's who's behind this big fraud, and the guy says Unitaid. So amazing how little things change. Based in Switzerland, a uh, global health initiative to prevent, diagnose, and treat diseases in low and middle income countries. I'm guessing very, Haiti is one of them. <laughs> yes, Unitaid was very big in Haiti. And again, here's Peter Strzok, right? Uh, just listen to his biography. You know, I just happened to be lucky enough to be, before I was 18, in three countries that were overthrown. Uh, is that because, uh, you know, coinky dink, or is that because your father was the active person helping people to overthrow those countries? Haiti, Burkina Faso, and then, of course, Iran. So, I mean, this is not, he's not the uh, chumley that everybody thinks he is. Uh, yeah, it reminds me of Nicholas Hager. So I, I'm about halfway through this book, uh, The Syndicate by Nicholas Hager. Have you ever f- heard of this guy, George? Yeah. And he's an MI6 guy. And, you know, he claims that he only worked for MI6 for four years, but he was a uh, English language professor and he just happened to be the English language professor in four countries in a row that got overthrown, you know, and and he's got all of these pictures in the book of himself with the president of this country and the president of that country. And, you know, that's just what English professors do in foreign countries is to go hang out with the presidents of those countries right before they get overthrown. Right. And you know what, Bill Bill Stevenson of MI6, he was you know the the shadow of the intrepid. He he we'd go for tea every day. It just so happened Stevenson was there from OS. <laughs> so all along the way, there he goes. Wasn't he right. a, a, a an understudy of Stevenson's? Uh, I, I I'm not that I, I'm not that far in the book, but he claims okay. that he was a college professor and that at one point he didn't have a college to teach at and so he decided that he was going to go work for MI6 but he only did that for four years and I'm reading that and I'm thinking you've been working for MI6 this whole book right yeah. like it's, yeah. um, he starts off the book with the uh, with the peak oil conceit that the reason that all of the things in the world are happening is and that again like RFK Jr. that all of these terrible bad things are happening but climate change is real you know um, so uh, it, it's interesting because I think that a long time ago, when I, I, I in another life, I would have read that book and th- thought and taken it all in. But now I'm hypercritical of everything. I, 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 I take what I think is real and then I, I can kind of assess what I think the cover stories are. There's always good information to get out of these books, but there's also a bunch of, you know, horseshit that's been put in there too. So you got to kind of sort it out. Well, Ian Fleming is the one understudy that with the James Bond of, of intrepid William Stevenson that I always go to as my go to. And all of these books seem to be kind of like Ian Fleming light. Well, I was watching. Uh, yeah, I was watching Jay Dyer have a conversation with Richard Grove about, I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago. And they were they were saying to people who wanted to get in, people who are interested in conspiracy theories, but wanted to understand Schwab no more. 
uh, don't schwab me, baby, um, that, uh, that if you really wanted to kind of uh, get an entree into uh, conspiracies without, uh, y you know, by grounding yourself in some kind of a framework of reality that reading Ian Fleming's biography and then reading A Man Called Intrepid, uh, Bill Stevenson's biography are kind of good because uh, Fleming, uh, you know, in, in the book, Fleming doesn't really uh, come off as anything more than kind of a, uh, a rich playboy who wanted to play in the intelligence game. But in, in Stevenson's book, he talks about how Fleming and Stevenson assassinated somebody in New York during World War II by shooting a rifle from one apartment building to another in, in Manhattan. And, uh, and Fleming was the trigger guy. Um, and, and that's where the license to kill came from, that Hoover actually gave um, uh, Stevenson uh, permission uh, to kill people who were collaborating with the Nazis in the United States. That's where the license to kill came from. And so Fleming actually did pull the trigger, according to uh, the, the Bill Steve the It's, it's weird because the William Stevenson's uh, biography is written by another guy named William Stevenson, but it's spelled differently. Yeah. Well, I, I do remember that their operational headquarters at Churchill had them down there in uh, some hotel in Manhattan. And that was their kind of... They had 2,000 employees in Rockefeller Center. Yeah, Rockefeller Center. That's what it was. <laughs> two, yeah. But they had two. They, they took up several floors so in this is when they Center. Were, this is when they were small at Rockefeller Center. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Hey, I wanted to ask Addy a quick question um, about uh, the second book and everything, just to get our plug in. Um, how's it going? How's, that, how's those book sales going? It's it's going well. It, it you know not as quite as good as my. I wanted another number one, but uh, it's it's all right because I got number one. I think intelligence debut on my first book, but it's it's all right. You know would it, it, my would profit margin is much bigger on on this one, so I don't need quite as many sales to to make uh, you know to make more money. Uh, so that that's good because my first book I really didn't make make a, anything on really in terms of profit margin. Would it help if everybody bought your book that's watching the broadcast now? Yes, yes, that would be that would be fantastic. Okay, and, uh, and so they can go on Amazon and just search how to cover the Glenn Maxwell trial, and it's going to come up. It's yep. only seven bucks on Audible, is that right? I, I think it's six bucks, uh, six bucks on on uh, ebook. Uh, yeah, and then uh, nine ninety nine paperback. You can also just type in Addy Ads uh, on Amazon, and it should should be the second one that pops up. A A D D Y A D D S. So, yeah, I appreciate that, George. Yeah, I just wanted to work you in here, make sure that uh, people know that this, this stuff's being documented. Peter, I'll throw it back to you at uh, Central uh, Stream. What about Central. your? Well, I was I, gonna say, what about your your most recent publishing, George? Uh, what, I, what is I, that? I haven't done anything in six months uh, because it's just been so hot news. Um, so, World War DARPA and and um, uh, the one about Texas, the Tex Med, a book are the mm. last two but you can get those at neighborhoodnewsstudio.com i don't get any money they get every all, every dime uh and it's a worthwhile cause but it's because it's the home of citizen journalism so there you go we got our yeah. ads out of the way you know addy and well i didn't do my ad which is oh. my, my my ad doesn't cost anything this week but okay. um but if you go to the duke .com and bookmark it which is this old school thing that you do with these tabs up here on your browser yeah, bookmarking. Just, just bookmark it. And here's the whole idea about the Duke Report is that uh, most of the news sites that I get my information from, uh, that I, and I try to stay away from the dialectic. I try to stay away from th this website represents this worldview and this website represents this worldview. All of the websites that I link to are, are evidence-based journalism. So they, there's, a, there's a spectrum of of viewpoints there, but they all have RSS feeds. So um, uh, that means that my website is sucking the links to those other sites out of them. And it's a convenient place for everyone to go where if you want to find out what's going on today that isn't necessarily a hot button, hot take link, because, because most of it is evidence-based journalism, 
Most of it takes a few hours at least, if not a day or two, in order to get synthesized and then turned into a story. So you're not going to get the knee-jerk stories on the Duke Report, but you are going to get some kind of in-depth and intelligent thinking about things that, that are evidence-based. And, um, and the reason that you should bookmark it is because uh, with all of these people getting banned, so for example, Paul Cottrell yesterday, uh, I don't know uh, whether or not, I, I don't know what happened, but he took all of his videos down. And different websites have different types of RSS feeds. So I can pull RSS feeds from YouTube, from BitChute, from Odyssey. I can't do it from Rumble or Rockfin at this point, but Addy was going to talk to the Rockfin people about that. Um, so what I did is uh, I spent a few hours, Paul, I spent a few hours because of this, but I figured out uh, going back and forth with the people at, uh, uh, I can't remember which service provider it was, um, how to, it was, it's not Odyssey and it's not YouTube, so which one is the other one? BitChute. Rumble. So I figured out I figured out how to pull an RSS feed out of BitChute. So now you can find Paul's stuff on there. Likewise, I'm linking to George Webb Substack if George Webb wants to start creating some content again. I, I mean, but again, the the problem with George is not that you it's not that you don't create content, George. It's finding it day to day. I, you know. Yeah. So I do need to go back to Substack now that Peter Struck uh, wars have begun. Um, so in, in, in the well, nice here, here's a, here's a, here's an idea though, and just to think. Of, I'm not telling you to do this. It's just something to think about. And I was talking to Addy about this yesterday. Richard Grove does one five to seven hour podcast a week on Sundays, and what he does is that he takes the news of the day and then he contextualizes it to all of this history. All because Richard Grove has read you know more background has more background on all of the stuff that we're talking about than anybody on the internet. And what he does is he contextualizes the news of the day with this book and this document that was published by this government organization. And then he kind of puts it all together. And he does it once a week. And the reason that it, it's interesting is because then what, it, what happens is that his producer goes back during the week and he's very organized about the way that he does it. So he'll do a 15 minute segment on one subject. And then he'll do another 15 minute segment on another subject. And what will, what it allows the producer to do is to go back and to cut those. So if he's just talking about, you know, this bioweapon thing in the Ukraine for 15 minutes, and they cut that up and then they repost it as a 15 minute um, video. So it's actually, you know, kind of a very clever way. It's kind of the way that they do game shows. I, a lot of people don't know this, but game shows uh, that you watch, the, I, I don't know, I haven't watched the game show on television in a long time, but like Jeopardy or The Price is Right or something like that, they shoot 10 of those in a day, right? So they shoot two weeks worth of content in one day. Um, so here's the Duke report. And then uh, what I'll, I also take a look at every article that's on here every day. And then I try to figure out whatever the most interesting thing I think that somebody who's just new to the site um, would go. So if you scroll back to the top there, Addy, um, uh, uh, James Corbett did a really great video yesterday on a deep dive on the history of this uh, digital ID thing that the World Economic Forum is trying to enslave us all with. Uh, and and how they're going to sell it as convenience and how they're going to sell it as safety and how they're going to sell it. But he does a really, you know, in-depth deep dive on this one subject, which is which is uh, digital IDs. Um, so what I do is I, I try to read every story that's on the Duke Report every day. And then I try to find one uh, that uh, somebody coming to the site might be interested in. Um, my... My business model right now is uh, I'm, I'm taking donations. Anybody wants to help me out with the server costs, that'd be highly appreciated. Uh, but the idea is is that if I can build it up to a critical mass where you've got enough people, uh, yeah, that's the Buy Me a Coffee website. Um, it, Marty Farrell's probably going to now tell me something bad about Buy Me a Buy Me a Coffee. But um, anyway, uh, I found a Buy Me a Coffee from Addy, so that's it's Addy's fault if there's anything wrong with it. Um, <laughs> So uh, the idea is, is that uh, uh, I want to build this thing up to a critical mass because as people are getting blown off of all these platforms right and left, I'm just trying to keep track of where they all are and just bring them together on one page, you know. 
And so uh, if you're looking for people, uh, you can click on it. I've got links to all everybody's website at the bottom. And then each link is just whatever the last story is that they just posted on their website. And then I also added a feature yesterday. If you scroll to the top there, Addy, uh, that says uh, the last 10 stories. So if you click on the last 10 stories and then you click on pick a name, it doesn't matter, um, Addy ads, then these are the last 10 things that Addy posted. Um, so this does a couple of things. It gives people a resource. Uh, also, it gives it gives uh, uh, Carrie, who's working with me on producing the site. It gives her the ability. A, a lot of times, we'll pick we'll be looking at a story, and then it'll get updated by the uh, by the originator, and then we can't find it on the homepage again. So I made that last ten stories so that we can always go back and find the last ten stories that were that were on the site. There's George's last ten, and. Uh, uh, and and so it, it does two things. One is it gives us a resource to be able to go back and check our work. The second thing is is that uh, I think that it does a great deal of search engine optimization. So for George Webb's uh, uh, Substack, uh, George Webb's name uh, uh, becomes associated with all the other names that are on this, and so it actually like raises the. I, I mean, I'm I'm stealing a little bit of the mojo from Matt Drudge here in 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 the way that you do this, but. Um, eventually, if I can build up enough traffic, uh, then I can run ads. Uh, like Matt Drudge would run one ad on the website, but when you're getting, he was getting 25 million page views a day. So if you get 25 million page views, you can run one ad and make a, make enough money in order to make the whole thing worthwhile. So I think but Mr. Gross producer is watching right now. He said, "Thanks for the shout out, Peter." Yeah, Thank indeed, for, indeed. For yep. Quote. I was going to say, Peter, you won't do a Matt Drudge type of thing, though, like with Monica Lewinsky was Matt Drudge's first big thing. Just well, when you start to, yeah, when you start to look at the way that any of these journalists got launched, I mean, David Brock, he wrote a hit piece on, on, on um, Bill Clinton, the Trooper Gate thing that he covered, I think, for townhall.com and then had a meeting with Bill Clinton and Media Matters was funded to the tune of $25 million a year and he switched sides. Um, you know, Andrew Breitbart was the original editor of the Drudge Report. Um, so well, I, I just noticed that, you know, the Monica Lewinsky scandal uh, went out at the same time as 78 days in a row of NATO bombing in Sarajevo and in Serbia. So it's just kind of like, oh, that happened at the same time. Interesting. Right. Because I don't remember anybody talking about the bombing and all these uh, blood videos that we're seeing all over the Internet 15 days into the Putin thing. I don't remember any of that for Clinton. 78 days. And we're not talking about precision weapons going after uh, Nazi Azov guys. We're talking about schools, churches, uh, airports, uh, uh, every every place. Was, no, no thing was off limits. Shock and awe. Six thousand people dead in 48 hours. You know, it's funny. I haven't heard anybody talk about shock and awe, even though we know when Colin Powell shook the yellow cake at us, he was wrong, right? I have, so, I have some yellow cake too here, George. Yeah, this is my new yellow cake yeah. prop. Yeah. <laughs> you know, shock and awe, you know. So it just, I, where were all these people during Sarajevo? Where were they during Belgrade bombing? Where were they during shock and awe? Remember Rumsfeld standing up there and every just exploding in every direction. They have to have these cameras on 24 hours now on something, and finally something will explode if they get it at all. It's two different wars, and I, that's why I say judge, judge Russia by what they go to the Security Council and say. If they're trying to say why they in, invaded, listen to what they say, and it's all about bioweapons, beginning to end. I watched the whole thing, beginning to end about bioweapons. Send me, send me that link, and I'll put it on the Duke report. Okay. Um, it's in French, <laughs> but it's translated okay. to English and I will, I will have it sent yeah. to you. Um, it's, uh, I'll give it to you. Right and, and we'll post it in the show notes below after the show. <laughs> okay. Ready for this? It's very short. Okay. Hang on. Right. It's, it's HTTPS. You guys can all do this at home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, colon, right? And this slash old, slash. Old, and he's going <laughs> to laugh. You guys you actually used to read each other URLs. Uh, yeah, slash slash, yes. F, no, I'm sorry, T dot M E. Yeah. 
slash mod underscore russia underscore en, en for english slash 60 and you'll Under, get underscast en 60 slash 60 yeah oh and slash 60 it, slash 60 and you'll get it. it's only it's only one page front and back i mean at least listen to what the russians say don't just say it's propaganda. It was interesting. These other people in the Security Council, you don't have very many Security Council members. It's like 21 or 22. It's not like 193 General Assembly, right? So and it's usually a pretty important reason that they call these things. I, I can't remember the last time Russia called one of these. I think it was the Syria bombing in 2014, right? How do you, these people go, we carefully listened to the Russians and it was all propaganda. They didn't do any research whatsoever. They had prepared statements saying it was propaganda. They didn't listen to anything they said. So again, we didn't have hardcore evidence of hardcore labs in 11 different locations that grew to 30 over an eight year ethnic cleansing war when we went into Iraq. We had something called curveball. Somebody told Tyler Drumheller that somebody in a hospital bed, right, in Iraq uh, was linked to Osama bin Laden. And, and the yellow cake were the two justifications for going into Iraq, right? So uh, Putin, I think, is saying, I had, didn't come up, Peter? Yeah, I, well, I have a Telegram channel. Um. Okay, it's a bird's eye view of the vineyard is, is where I got this. But it could be I'm sending on a goose chase. But I'm just I'm just saying that why can't we have just a little bit of objectivity at this on this war and just say maybe there is I mean we know that the Victoria Newland said the labs exist, right? We're not talking well, about I, I, look, I think if there was objectivity we wouldn't have wars. Like the, 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 uh, there's obviously an agenda here, right? And they want to sell one agenda to cover the other agenda. <laughs> but, right. But that's, but that's the game, right? You make up, you know, we, it, we put Japan, you know, between a rock and a hard place in, in 1940 uh, by cutting them off from their strategic oil reserves or from their ability to expand their energy requirements. Um, you know, the, people don't talk about that. Um, you know, so I look at the dynamics of the pipelines and stuff, and I think, oh, it's like Japan and the United States in 1940. It's like when you, when you push people up against a wall, when the, when the banks are lending the country's money in order to build all of these munitions. Like, we've been building a lot of weapons. I mean, Trump uh, spent all of that money to build the military back up. You think that they don't want to drop those bombs someplace? Like, they, they need to go use that stuff. I, I agree with you. You know, war mongers beget war. I agree with that. Uh, I'm just saying that can't we have a little bit of objectivity? You know, as soon as somebody well, comes, we can, we can. we the the people, capital T, capital P, and the people who are watching this thing right now and have the gumption to go watch this. But if you're going to go watch Brian Stelter or or uh, uh, Sean Hannity, you know. Uh, then you're going to get a different. You're you're not going to get the objectivity. Eddie, give us your thoughts on the uh, on the war. Yeah, it's. Uh, I just had a, a guest on earlier today, Adam Fitzgerald, who was was talking about it. You know, and he mentioned uh, the Azov Battalion, of course, and uh, you know Western intelligence funding funding that, uh, similar to other paramilitaries around the world that they funded but nonetheless uh i mean he contended that putin was still committing war crimes i think that you know unless you know somebody's on the ground over there it's tough to say with any certainty what what it actually is happening uh, i don't foresee any other nation states i don't think getting getting involved uh without causing a, a, another world war. Um, so I, in that sense, you know, I, I don't think it's going to e expand, but I do think China is waiting for the right moment to uh, take Taiwan, uh, whether that's going to be before the end of the year or not. Some people are thinking it's going to be until after midterms, uh, which makes sense. Uh, I'm 
tend to guess that they err on the side of patience just because they don't have these four-year election cycles like we do uh, in the West uh, or, or six-year. You know, it's it's a lifetime emperorship. So in that sense, uh, it is more strategic to be patient for uh, for the Chinese. I mean, if you just think about it from like a board game perspective, like you would want the United States and NATO to commit to fighting Russia before you took ta- you went to Taiwan. Because if the United and, and and frankly, that's probably uh, a major reason why NATO, uh, it appears, is trying to not start the war. Um, even though I think there are hawks within NATO that that definitely want to do that, um, you you would wait for a commitment um, that was not easy. Like as soon as the United States becomes engaged with Russia, then all of the resources. Uh, or the lion's share of the resources of the military are going to get concentrated in that area, at which point, you know, we all know what happened to Hitler and, you know, Napoleon when they tried to fight wars on two fronts. It doesn't work very well. In Russia, <laughs> specifically. Yeah. That land war in Asia, I think we all saw Princess Bride. I mean, that's where half my military <laughs> strategy comes from. But, uh, no, it, it is interesting how, if you're the banker, and you are the banker for all sides. It's amazing how you can cut off funding right in front of a critical battle, and then make lots of money on the stock exchange. Uh, you know, War of eighteen twelve and a House of uh, Rothschild, I think, comes to mind. Uh, you know, is Hitler not another one of those Napoleonic war things that happened? Is exactly. this not another one of those things? Yeah, exactly. And that's why when people get you know wrapped up in you know the the racist or anti Semitic Part of it, I mean, to, to uh, jo- in the George Webb parlance, that's a throw, right? Because it's really just kind of like this banking, rest- Hegelian banking restructuring. I mean, I, I the the one big takeaway, and I, the reason I would I would recommend uh, Nicholas, um, um, what's his last Sergeant, name? Sergeant Sergeant Hager. What Hager? Oh, Hager. Hager. Ni- yeah, Nicholas Hager's uh, syndicate book, and there is a. Uh, companion volume too that I have that I bought that I haven't read yet um, is that he does a really good job of breaking down the Rothschild Rockefellerish. He calls them Rockefellerites and Rothschildites. And that I, I look at what's going on right now in uh, in Ukraine, and I I know that the Rockefellers are very heavily invested in Russia. They always have been for a hundred years, and the and oil and resources is their game that they like to play. And I'm pretty sure that the Rothschilds are behind the World Economic Forum and NATO. And so what I see going on in Ukraine is you've got the Rockefellers lined up on one side and the Rothschilds lined up on the other. And that would sound counterintuitive to a lot of people because they think, well, don't they partner on things? Don't, aren't they bankers? Like, what are they doing? What they're doing is they're making money. Okay. The, the, the Rothschilds are pumping, are, are loaning money to NATO. They're loaning money to the United States. They're loaning all of this money. And the Rockefellers are doing the same thing on the other side. And it doesn't matter who wins or loses because the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers are going to win either way. So, um, you know, I, I look at this thing and I just start thinking about Zbigniew Brzezinski's The Grand Chest Board. Uh, and is that really a metaphor? Or is that actually what they do? Is this real? Are they really like just looking at a risk board, and all of these millions of lives are are represented by little plastic pieces that are on a board, and they're just pushing them around? Because it kind of se- kind of seems that way. Well, if Ukraine becomes a part of NATO <laughs> over this, uh, then I think you're right. I think you know Putin gets his slug in the deal and uh, gets Crimea and gets the Donbass, and then. They carve up. I mean, when, when you he have, gets everything east of the Dnieper. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. he and maybe Kiev. I, I I say no Kiev, but I say well, maybe Kiev. Kiev will be a free city. I like, think it'll be like a checkpoint, like, Charlie. Maybe. Like Danzig, like Danzig. Remember East Berlin, West Berlin? I think yeah. that's that's Kiev. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and hey, everybody wins because you get two million people to leave the country. Hey, we'll take your stuff, and the rest you. Uh, You know, there's all these, they become test dummies for these test experiments, the UP1, UP2, all these Ukraine projects. UP8 is the one, the Ukraine Project 8 is the Crimea hemorrhagic fever. Not only are they giving it to the soldiers, but then giving it to the population. 
I, there's a Dnepr there, the snaking through there. Mm -hmm. I see somebody in the chat saying, because I said Q fever uh, was being tested here at the Odessa lab, that makes me a Q conspiracy <laughs> So Yeah, I and, just, and, and I can just see Peter Strzok tomorrow saying, I told you so, he said Q fever. And uh, again, and was he staying at the uh, Reinhard Gellin Airbnb when he was in Odessa? I mean, you know, it's like all of these things just overlap, you know? Well, all these Nazis, I hate to say the Galicia Brigade there up in the upper left there, Lviv and so forth, Stephen Bandera, Lee Stranahan, uh, our thoughts are and prayers are out to you. Lee uh, had another stroke and is in the hospital in, in South Dakota. But uh, Lee Stranahan had, had this down. Uh, Stephen Bandera, Labed, to the current Nazis right now in, in Western Ukraine, uh, it hasn't changed. And when you see these papers of talking about these Ukrainian bio labs wanting to go get blood samples of people of Slavic descent, but they won't pay for Ukrainian blood. They'll only pay for Russian blood. When you see these stories about these bat convoys with flea bitten, flea ridden bats being driven to Russia to infect cattle and then infect the people who work on the farms from Kharkov there. It's so hard to believe, you know, migratory birds, you know, putting fleas on them. I don't think the migratory birds thing that came out during the Security Council meeting is is uh, I think that's cover. I, that doesn't make any sense to me because it's easier to get Kola Moisky to hire, you know, transport logistics to take the bats directly to the place where you want to release them to, let's say, Tbilisi during a, a war. But, you know, migratory bird, you know, I can go anywhere. Um, but that's what came out of this meeting. 140 cages of bats that are infested with these fleas. Bats are everywhere. What is it? Is 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 it because they don't migrate? Is that the is that the reason why they're highly desirable as a transport mechanism? Well, the reason why they're reservoirs is they're uh, ph phylogenically back in time, and so they don't have a developed immune system. So all the things you infect them with don't affect them. Um, so they become, and a lot of people said, you know, the Nazis, a lot of these were covert programs. You had to work with a mammal under, underground. You couldn't have, you know, a weapons program above ground. They'd get bombed. Mm -hmm. So they worked a lot with the bats. Uh, the Owl Mountains is where they put all these bioweapon secrets in east, in southern Poland there, uh, just to the, to the north there, uh, or, or right by Ukraine. So there's just a whole, uh, Battelle Labs, you know, in Columbus. So before, we had, before we moved them to the Rocky Mar Mountain Arsenal? Well, Rocky Mountain National Laboratories and, and then Winnipeg Laboratories also has a lot of these uh, pathogens. There's, there is 336 uh, BSL labs now. It's a tremendous explosion. All I need to do is drive the truck with the bats in the truck. They can infect some animals. And then, you know, two years later, you have a BSL lab there because we have to protect the local livestock. And eventually, it's just like missile silos. You know, it's just like, OK, well, now we have a complete capability surrounding the old Soviet Union with their with their bioweapons. Yep. Everything old is new again. It's uh, we live. We, we li do, do you think we live in maybe the most interesting moment in U.S. In, in not 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 U.S. in global history? I mean, the fact that so many people can communicate with each other and there are so many. I, I know that it's confusing and. Nobody really knows what to believe, but I think, you know, at certain points I just take a step back and I look at everything going back and forth and I go, wow, this is really amazing how many people are talking to each other, how many people believe different things, uh, how people uh, create a system uh, of judging. It's funny, uh, somebody had a, I think it was the guy who was uh, Jimmy Wales. Uh, CF, uh, Jimmy Wales, WEF, by the way, uh, founder of Wikipedia, is a WEF. Uh, I, I, I found a list, or I, uh, Wikispooks is my new favorite website because they have it's lists of what? It's a great one. Because they have lists of, uh, I downloaded all of them, the, uh, the names of every person who's ever been a young global leader at the World Economic Forum. Uh, so, you know, Jimmy Wales' name popped in there. But Jimmy Wales had a partner, and his name uh, escapes me right now, but somebody in the chat window. Larry will Sanger. Larry Sanger, right. And Larry Sanger was talking about how the three fact checking websites on the internet are like complete, you know, uh, completely bogus. They don't uh, 
they don't do anything. There, there is one that Tracy recommends, which is uh, now the name of it is escaping me. Uh, Newsguard, not Newsguard. Um, well, Politifact is a, a you know yeah. in the Clinton Foundation building. Um, the one down in Florida, they have an office in Florida, so they say they're not completely Clinton Foundation. But Snopes, we call it Nopes, because whatever you say, oh, that's that's fake. You know, they're like they don't even look at the article. They go, right. that's completely false. You know, that's Nopes. That's all. If that's all you had to do for a living, that'd be so yeah. easy. You know, like, like we, gra- don't, we don't we don't see anything. We don't see anything, and we're not lying. We don't see anything. Right, ground ground news is the one that Tracy uses, but ground news also uses a left right spectrum. And again, I'm. I'm at a point right now where I've I've evolved in my thinking to the idea that anytime tell anytime someone tells you there's two ways to do anything, they're lying, okay? Because that's a manipulation. We all know that there's lots of different ways to solve problems, and there's always more than two. <laughs> so if your if your answer is red or blue, okay, on how you solve this problem, then you're missing the entire you know rainbow of of uh, opportunities to to solve a problem and uh and so that's my one issue with ground news is that they use this kind of like left right dem- uh dimension i don't know how else you do it but um i was thinking remember in ebay uh one of the things uh, i i had this idea for a website about five or six years ago and a guy came to me and he paid me a bunch of consulting dollars and i had a non-compete so i could never really go do the idea but it was basically how do you maintain how do you rate the veracity of news sources and i was taking a shower this morning and i was thinking well you know ebay back in the day what they would do is that they would have people uh rate uh, a seller right or rate a buyer and if we had a now of course you can game that with bots and all this other stuff but if you actually had a way that people could who are verified users could rate uh the veracity of a different news story as instead of thumbs up thumbs down thumbs up thumbs down means true or false or uh, instead of i like it or i don't like it then maybe there's some kind of way you could do that but well let me jump on your first question which is uh our unique moment in history both addy and i were at january 6th and we saw with our own eyes what happened uh we saw like woodstock 50 you know, Eddie was laughing. You know <laughs> how old we all were. We and, were all uh, three there, and we were yeah, all freezing. Well, yeah. well, I was with Eddie. You were there yeah. too. But l- l- that's like our, gen- you know, grandfather's generation or father's generation's Pearl Harbor. That's going to be remembered like Pearl Harbor. Okay. At well, course, if the course, Democrat, if the Democrats get their way, it'll be like Pearl Harbor. Well, either either way, it's gonna, it's not going to be all hey that Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and we need to declare war. It, we'll always remember it in a divided way, we're, but we actually were there. And that is an amazing thing because we can tell the story of what really happened. There was four psych ops guys that got bust in and was a whole bunch of old people looking for toilets. You know, I mean, that, <laughs> that's what happened, folks. I know. It, it was I, Woodstock 50. Somebody needs to gra- engrave that in granite. <laughs> That's what happened. That's what happened. It was uh, Emily Brady and the four buses came in and they went over the fence and somehow a whole bunch of Ukrainians came out of the Capitol. How did they get inside? Well, how did they know that that was going to happen? Why are they yelling faster, faster, faster in Russian when they're breaking the windows? How was CNN set up with Kodak moment camera shots, camera spots all around the Capitol? How does that happen? Why are they practicing overseas and then being flown in? How did they get uh, visas? All these questions. Again, you got to go back to Peter Strzok. Where does Peter Strzok's number one crime fighting crime unit exist? It's in Ukraine and it's called the Naboo. And Peter, you and I were there with Roger Stone and uh, Lee Stranahan when he told us all for the first time about the Naboo. Uh, Gosh, that was 2018. Right. We went, oh my gosh, he's right. (laughs) This is the people that came up with the Trump dossier. These are the people who came up with the, the Black Ledger. This is the source of all the spies in the Trump campaign, the Chalupas and everybody in the 68 journalists at American University. This is the whole story right here, the Naboo. Peter Strzok's, uh, you know, I had a question for Peter Strzok. Peter, I haven't tweeted this out to you yet, but do you know, I got a whole bunch of FBI documents here. Do you know about the Azov Brigade? 
and Peter knows about it. Hattie knows about it. I know about it. Your FBI counterintelligence, do you know about it? It's actually the Azov Battalion. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of yes. the Zephyr Brigade and Azov yeah. Battalion. But Peter, yeah. do you know about it? I think he does, right? So do you know who runs it and finances it? I know. Eddie knows. Peter, you know, Kolomoisky funds it. So so why don't you mention Kolomoisky? When you start talking about me and Q fever, and here's right? where and here's where things start to get really like interesting and complicated too. Kolomoisky's got an Israeli passport, right? Yes, he does. <laughs> and 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 pe so people ask the question: Why are why is a Jew financing Nazis? Right. I, Sorry, this is sort of a left-right paradigm too. Only it's left of the Dnieper and, and right of the Dnieper. <laughs> it is. And, and, and the answer is the, the Western side sided with the Nazis in World War II, and the Eastern side of the Dnieper sided with the Russians. So, and they've divided the country that way, and they're splitting profits that way, and it's just a business deal. And Kiev is the center point where the nexus of everything meets. We're good. Uh, Peter and Addy, I'll see you guys at Checkpoint Charlie next year. Uh, we'll meet there at the Brandenburg Gate there in Kiev. All righty. Yes, that's... Yeah, not not Berlin, Kiev. We're gonna make a new Brandenburg Gate, or I, that's my point. Is I think you're gonna have. No, no a, I think I got you. Yeah, you're gonna have a segregated Ukraine, just like we had yep. with Germany. You're gonna have this is the new Cold War. Uh, we need to fund now. The you know Putin's on the march. Uh, China's aggressive and gonna take the the islands there, and they're gonna take Taiwan. They're gonna take Hong Kong. You can see all this coming. They're beating the war drum for all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I just don't see how, like, where I'm going to escape to, guys, because you guys are in the clear, pretty much. What do you mean? Uh, what, why, because we'll be gone? Uh, <laughs> no, that's not what I meant. I'm just saying, I think, like, if they do, like, a, a draft, a war draft, how are you going to, they're just going to close the border to any male under 60, right? So it's, there's, like, going to be nowhere to hide. Whereas you guys are going to be fine. You guys are... I mean, hopefully, I'll, I'll leak information. I, you know, I, I, I look, I look. I think that they've gotten much more efficient in in getting rid of lots of people without having to blow things up. I think that they don't like blowing things up because they like repurposing and using them. So I'm not, I'm not I'm not afraid. I, I'm I'm more afraid of my daughter getting drafted uh, than any than than anything. But um, I don't I don't I don't see World War three actually really happening the way that I, I think we're in World War three you know there's an interesting card and I was talking to Addy about this the other day I'll, I'll see if I can pull it up um, let me see I'm gonna type in CERN tarot cards okay okay because because I was telling Addy the other day uh, uh, Tracy and I talked about this uh, on our podcast once but there is a set of tarot cards here we go I'm going to share my screen and make this a little smaller. See if I can share this. Susan Treisler it was a artist in residence at CERN. Now, um, George, can you explain to me why some place like CERN has an artist in residence? Because you, you can use NATO money to rinse all the technology, and then you come up with some like Zuckerberg or some Andreessen kind of character. We could, Addy would be a great guy, young genius. And you just say, hey, I, hey, he invented this. And then you, you capitalize it, you put the CERN stamp on it, and just Tim Berners Lee, I mean, with HTML, met Tim, he wouldn't shake my hand. Um, so, but, so, the, so I found this very interesting. So, what's great about the, the tarot cards from from CERN is that, George, it's the greatest hits of every conspiracy that you've ever talked about are, are on the tarot cards. So, and this was Q done fever. from, Q what? Q fever. I, I'm sure that if we go find Q fever, it's in there someplace. But this is the world card and it says WW1, WW2, and then WWW. And I looked at this and I thought, is this when World War Three started? You know, in 1993, you know, when the world, when Tim Berners-Lee, a guy who works at a particle physics laboratory. How did a guy who works at a particle physics laboratory invent the World Wide Web? Yeah, and the the whole original idea. I, I don't remember if you remember. Uh, Apple had a thing called Apple Card, mm -hmm. and, and it would 
uh, on a little local Apple Talk network, it would fire up things over a network, and you, you could watch Apple Card. And somebody just said, hey, you know. Hi they, Hyper Card. Hyper Card. Hyper Card. That's right. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a creative thing that Jobs had. And somebody went, hey, wait a minute. If we hook this up to our network and had HyperCard for the internet, we would have HyperCard for the internet. Yes. And then, and then somebody said, well, how are we going to rinse this and steal it? And they said, well, Tim's not doing anything. <laughs> and then Tim wrote up a paper, supposedly. One right. Half, half that's the way. Paper. That's, yeah, he was the original internet cutout. Yeah. And, and then Tim uh, went to his boss and said, well, here's what I did instead of doing the project that I should have been doing. And, and he was going to get fired in a, this whole Tim Berners Lee folklore. Right. And then uh, he uh, he decided, no, I'm going to publish. I'm going to go out in the big, bad world and I'm going to publish. And then that is the story of HTML. So there you go. Right. H HTML, which is. Oh, yeah. Here's the Empress card. This is a good one. This is got all of the intelligence agencies in the world. Now, why does CERN hire an artist in residence who does tarot cards that have things like every intelligence agency on the world on them? I, you know, it's just, it's just very odd to me. Yeah, and, and HTML is just basically SGML with, a, with, a, uh, with an extra set of tags in order to be able to put them on a server. And then you've got, and then a college student in the United States of America, Mark Andreessen, who's also a young global leader at the World Economic Forum. Uh, he leaves the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana to found uh, Netscape because he, he wrote Mosaic, right? Um, he I, wrote so Mosaic. I was, I was in Silicon Valley when all this was happening. And like Mark Andreessen would go out to all these little places and make speeches. And Jim Clark of, of Silicon Graphics and Mark uh, Dorr, uh, Jim Dorr. Jim uh, Dorr, yeah. Yeah, of the uh, Jim Dorr Capital. They were on him like, you know the proverbial words. They were coaching him on everything to say. Right. right. And Dreesen's a good guy. But, you know, basically they said, here's a stack of code that we have from NSF. We had this big National Science Foundation development on the Internet. I know some people really close on the inside of this. And they said, how do we do a private DARPA? And they said, hey, let's Addy adds again. We'll say he's, you know, the genius that came up with all this. Addy's this genius. But, you know, we need somebody to take this thing public. Steve Jobs did a lot of that stuff. If you look at the mouse from uh, the. Uh, yeah, from, well, that was from uh, Par Xerox Angle Park. Park. Yeah, yeah there Park. was a. Yeah, if you want to, if if people want to see something really interesting, there's a, a I, 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 me I keep meaning to go back and watch the whole series, but there was a PBS series done in the 90s called Triumph of the Nerds and then Triumph of the Nerds 2.0. And um, in that series, they kind of go, there's a guy named Robert X. Cringely. I, I'm not making that name up. And he does the, uh, you know, it's, it's, he's the host of the show. And they go through a lot of the nuance of all of that stuff. But the way that the story gets told on that show is that the guys at Xerox were so frustrated because they had developed basically the desktop operating system uh, that was called star and it had a mouse and it had clickable icons on a desktop and you could click and drag and all of these things george probably remembers but like when i was a computer science major we used 4chan cards and then they came out with crt monitors and you would write a program by writing one line at a time into a computer it was very archaic and the first time i saw a the first time I grabbed a mouse and clicked on an icon and it opened, I laughed out loud. Like I thought, this is going to be, this is going to change everything <laughs> because I knew how hard it was in order to get that, th that little cartoon to happen in order to, and what was going on underneath it. So yeah. the way Cringely tells the story is that the Xerox Park people and, and the, who was at Xerox Park? Um, uh, who's the head of Adobe? Um, a gym, is that, uh, Bill what? Hewlett, or no? The, the guy, Bill who, no, no, the guy who's the head of Adobe had the patent on PostScript, John Warnock. So John Warnock uh, founded Adobe based on his patent that he patented while he was working for Xerox. So somehow he managed to own the patent when he was working for a big company like Xerox. Uh, he started Adobe Systems basically by every time 
somebody sold a printer or a font, every time somebody buys a printer or a font is used, John Warnock gets paid. And that's where the money came from in order to create Adobe. There was another guy at Xerox Park who invented Ethernet. Um, there was another guy who invented the the, the mouse. There was Metcalf. another guy. Metcalf did the internet and uh, Ethernet, and then the mouse was Doug Engelbart. Right. All the all these guys were financed by the Department of Defense after World War II to miniaturize uh, plain avionics, and the uh, Moffett Field was the big test field. And all of the that's in uh, that's in San Jose, California. Well, it's a little bit further Mountain View, a little bit further north. Uh, or, yeah, it's about yeah. I've been there actually. I, I worked right across the street, so I <laughs> I remember it pretty well. So the but that that's what we're talking about is this packaging. If you look at the guys who founded uh, HP, and you look at the guys who founded Tektronics, and all this, all of these were war instruments that came out of the Office of Scientific soft science and technology uh vanderveer bush and you just had to keep developing it until it was ready for prime time and then you you try to roll it out xerox star fell on its face it was a thirty thousand dollar computer for the bitmap graphics uh apple came out with lisa ten thousand didn't work he came out with mac at three and that was the sweet spot uh, and, and that was just moore's law it just came out too early yeah 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 i mean uh, I think with uh, you know with desktop publishing or or any of these things, color prepress or citizen journalism. Four years ago, I was maybe the only game in town because Peter Duke said, "You got to f- have phone will travel," and you're in front of the White House. You're just the same as Brett Bear, you know, as if you have the content. Now it's different. Now it's being rolled up uh, a little bit, but. Um, I think all these things are going to uh, start new industries. Citizen journalism is going to be a totally new industry. Addie's right there at the beginning of it. This um, was the internet. I was at UC Santa Barbara in 74, and they had added a couple. I think they had added the University of Indiana and a, a couple of other schools. But the original art, the original internet was UCLA, UCSB, SR, Stanford Research Institute, and the University of Utah. Four nodes on the internet yep i uh, know somebody who worked there uh at arpanet and in the early days and then rolling it over and then they moved to washington dc when it moved to uh, uh the darpanet so and this is the this is the temperance card george and aren't you in temperance michigan isn't that where you guys operate the neighborhood news studio adam uh, yeah um that's the command center uh, uh, metroplex we call oh, it i don't okay. ever like to just say headquarters uh but okay. uh, no no i'm i'm in atlanta now uh so i'm a remote roving reporter uh but yeah they're in temperance uh, what were you doing I, across from moffitt uh, for work uh, george i worked at sun microsystems in mountain view uh, for a long time and i worked at uh, uh, the founder of sun microsystems was also a young global leader Scott McNeely, yep, I know Scott, and uh, Bill Joy also, uh, who the guy who had Berkeley Unix, um, Vinod Kosla, who was another founder. Well, Richard, yeah, Richard, one hundred thousand dollars to start Google. So all these guys, all these guys were right there in Mountain View. Yeah, yeah. John Doerr was the guy financing all this stuff, and Kleiner Perkins was the guys financing everything on Sand Hill Road. It was all in like a little three blocks area, um, and. That was, when they say private DARPA, they mean private DARPA. They take the stuff that we spend trillions to develop, and then they spend thirty-eight dollars to commercialize, and then they make trillions because they didn't pay anything for the R and D. We did. Game. We did. Yeah, we, we did. did. <laughs> and some some dudes in the military did most of the work. Right. They did all that. the work. They yeah. did all the work. Yeah. In the uh, in the. Uh, in the video that's uh, highlighted on the Duke report, uh, uh, James Corbett coined a phrase that I'm go- that I stole. He calls voting boxes slave suggestion boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I guess waste baskets would be a very good term. So yeah, yeah. Well, anyway. this is this is interesting art. You know, I, I'm re- waiting for the Q fever card. Uh, you know, if if Strzok's going to play the Q Fever card on me, I'd love to see a Q Fever piece of artwork from CERN. 
Yeah, I'm looking. I, I have to go through the cards again and see if I can draw the bioweapon card. I, I don't know if there is one, but I, my guess is there. everything else is in here, so it's probably in there someplace. We did a deck of cards, I don't know if you remember, in March 2020 uh, during the you know news conference that shook the world, Peter, mm -hmm. of the bioweapons cards. And Peter Strzok was on there, and so was Peter Strzok Sr., uh, the bioweapons kids. And, and I, I haven't moved off that one iota. Um, we have the IP addresses. We have the back channel. Uh, the world is the ones catching up to us on this one. Um, it's good to see your Twitter's uh, going back to the the numbers it was at before, George. Uh, before that, uh, that lunch in Atlanta where it got hacked when I went to the bathroom and then I came back and I was like, hey, George, you lost your Twitter. And you were like, oh, shoot. You're blowing <laughs> up again. You're blowing up again. Yeah. I mean, I, I never had anything really go over 60,000, but I had the one in, in Florida where I was at uh, Key Wade Island with the Bidens and so forth. Went to 360,000, something like that. The only thing I ever had any close to that was 750,000 views on the Peter Duke video oh, uh, wow. that, we, uh, we, that we did on NATO. And uh, here's, here's what happened at NATO. i just say it really quickly. We, uh, somebody said the word that begins with a B. We said, don't, the, the, the guy said Chinese foreign minister said the American delegation of soldiers, the delegation we met State Department, we looked at all the State Department athletes that began with a B. We said, is there any relationship to the guy who left the door open at Fort Detrick, which is Sina Bavari? Somebody searched that letter B and found, yes, they, they did a document called the R&D blueprint for viruses and vaccines. And guess what? The person with the B was getting all of the uh, proposals, tr the trillion dollar proposals. Then we found out that person's husband, and it was, it was Virginia was the name, also his mother was named Virginia. So in one, in one family group, mother and father and son and daughter-in-law, we had four people working in biosurveillance. This person ended up working for the chief of NATO and was a State Department employee. That's just for starters. Then we found two other guys who were top spy echelon at NATO in Europe. So, again, this is this is like six. You're Manassi's. not saying right, George. Right. Yeah, I'm not saying the name, but it was like six Manassis in the first day. Oh, sorry. I just said it. There was six Manassis that, that all worked for the highest level. of no, no, I'm not saying in, I'm not saying I'm not saying. Yeah. In, in biosurveillance, you know, like, how do you how do you go? OK, well, I better cover up on this one. It, it's it's a minor story. It just affects every man, woman and child in the world. And this could be the next 50 years, folks. This could be the next bio cold war. So, yeah, let's go ahead and bury that story. No, I don't think that was the right play. And we did the bio cards, and the rest is history. Indeed. And maybe that's a good uh, time to ask if anybody's got any, like, last questions here. Did you want to mention your st the status of your proceedings, George, or, or no? Or... Oh, sure. Um, I've got two actions going. I've got um, – I may have a third action going against Peter Strzok, I guess. Um, for saying I'm a Q fever person. I've never ever developed any Q fever for any, I've never tested any soldiers in Ukraine. I've never been to Afghanistan and spread Q fever there. I've never infected any herds in, in Holland near the Erasmus lab. Never have I not even, in, not even in a dream, not even in a dream. So, yeah. so Peter struck, you got me wrong as the Q fever guy. That's somebody else that, you know, I think it's Kolomoisky, but I think you got me confused with Kolomoisky. But anyway, having said that, um, yes, there is a lawsuit with CNN. Um, we are still waiting uh, for the judge to accept my amended complaint. I'll be the first to admit there's a slight specificity problem in the first complaint where they said you, did, you weren't, you know, chapter and verse enough. And I corrected that in the, in the amended complaint. Um, I presented case law with this judge saying that that's something that you do with a pro se client. Uh, and that's where it hangs right now. And we're waiting for the judgment on, do I get the amended complaint? I still think I can move forward with the original complaint because it's, it, we talk about false light. So I can say, if, Addy, you are, you know, at January 6th as a reporter for Latinos for Trump, and you're doing your job as a reporter, 
if I then went and said you were a conspirator that caused the whole thing, that's putting you in a false light. You weren't. You were there as a reporter. So I can still I still have false light, even if I don't have the specificity that they want in the lawsuit. Right. So uh, so that's the update on the lawsuit. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you're still at neighborhoodnews.com and then twitter.com slash real George Webb one one the digit. Yes, I'm at Real George Webb, the numeral one. Uh, I'm doing this podcast with you guys. I'd love to this to be. How come you can't get your old account back? Because it was hacked and they actually have control of it. I sent in a thing to Twitter and said, hey, they took my account. They hacked it. They destroyed all the tweets, everything. Can I get my original thing back? They said, oh, sorry, you've been hacked. That guy um, still messaged me sometimes. Yeah, it still messages me too. And yeah. I, I, I had to block him because he he started a conversation with me the other day, and it was like I almost answered. <laughs> I'm telling you, these guys play for keeps. Yeah, these guys play for keeps. You know, they're still collecting money with my name. I mean, this is out and out fraud, and and you know, uh, forty thousand people have Wait. spent. A long time trying to figure out who I really, you know. Where so I Derek work. Wilkinsonson, Wilsonson, who's he's he's got a, a a very a checkered past on this cast. He says he offered it. I offered it him back. It, it, yeah, he, they, they, this person, male or female, offered it back to me after hacking it and creating confusion with all my followers. So this is the hacker. I believe it is, or yeah. a consortium. There's a group of three or four that change identities and so forth, depending on time of day and so, and so forth. There's a, a international people involved in this, this hacking thing. Uh, this has to come out in court because this is the disruption that's happening. There's another YouTube guy who makes YouTubes every day that's also trying to disrupt the CNN case, uh, calling everybody. Oh, the, oh the, guy, the guy who calls me a gang stalker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, that? this guy. Oh, that guy. Uh, no, 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 no. That guy. Yeah. And he is saying everybody in the court is, is in a conspiracy with me to commit fraud on the court. I accused him of forging documents. I mean, accused the judge, said the judge should be sanctioned. This person is under sanction in the uh, Southern District of New York. Two different judges have sanctioned, I believe. And there's also a violation of a protective order. This is a federal judge order in violation of protective order. So that's what we're that's the kind of disruption we're getting, right? So you destroy my account. It's sort of like somebody coming in your house, oh, the, the, stealing the, the, all your the, money. The, he says that you. he says that he's has he archived your old tweets? Like what kind of a scumbag are you? <laughs> really? Well, it's a consortium. A, a yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, whoever you are tweeting, you have but, but I have the out, lowest opinion of you of any human being on the planet. So thank you very much because this person put out tweets in my name impersonating me trying to uh defame me uh and this is this is an operation here to to think this yeah. is just one person it, and this is not connected to cnn wrong this is connected to cnn the other youtuber coming in out of nowhere hey hang on he's claiming something else here he's saying because that person dropped the twitter i saw it was available to register so i registered it so one person hacks it and then the other person picks it up immediately in a in a conspiracy and that's something that 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 makes it okay to steal no that's a conspiracy between those two people so is he I, offering I, if he if he offered to give it to you back then he must okay then give it back right so, but but send the, us a text message give us the oh, credentials you tell know? us because that person knows the original person that hacked it i know who the original person who hacked it is we're going to go for the records and that's all going to come out in this disruption against the cnn case they don't want this to move forward this case sorry guys this is fake news versus real news this is fake news versus real news you put out the real story hey there's six different banassies in the first half hour of doing any kind of research and everybody works for nato and everybody's at the highest level of nato and and the state department's involved at the highest levels oh my god and they're getting all the coronavirus bids i can't believe this is happening let's do a card deck you know that's the first thing that we said is we got to do a card deck there's so many people we need to do a card deck Peter, you were there <laughs> uh, virtually. We had to do a card deck. There were so many Benassi's involved in the first half hour, right? So, so that in a dream, in a dream, yeah. 
So, so we had to do a card deck. It wasn't just five or six Manassis. So, so in a dream. In a dream. So that's what I'm saying here is that's the disruption. You have NABU is the uh, National Anti-Crime uh, Bureau unit in Kiev. All my hacks have come from Kiev. My uh, Trello board hacked Kiev. Instagram hacked Kiev. Twitter hacked Kiev. Uh, uh, Gmail hacked Kiev. Two two uh, layer authentication hack. That's sophisticated, right? Man in the middle. Uh, well, I think you have to have an old device uh, to get the code. Uh, anyway. Uh, anyway. There you go. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to take the. That's okay. Show. We should we should wrap it up at this point. I think. Yeah. Yeah. We should. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Addy and I are going to be back in an hour or so. About half an hour. Half an hour with Reed Coverdale. You want to pitch the Reed Coverdale yes. show, Addy? Yes. Yeah, our second show of the Sunday. Reed Coverdale, trucker. He runs the show called The Naturalist Capitalist. We covered the People's Convoy in, in Hagerstown, Maryland together. And it's going to be a great chat. So uh, if you guys want to hear Peter and I talking geopolitics with the trucker, then join us at 6.30, I believe is what we're shooting for. So, um, Does AC Truth have a question? Next time. Okay, next show. Next show, ask us something. Or... Can we do this again next week? It sounds good to me. Four o'clock? Sure. Peter? Yeah, that's fine. Done. All right. I'll see you guys next week. Four o'clock. Talk to you uh, soon. East okay. Coast time. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye. have a good week, George. Stay frosty. Stay frosty. Whatever that means. You have to tell me next time.